now I'm um, going to introduce our next talk, which is a debate uh, that Dr. Jones will be moderating. Uh, I'll just give a, a brief little introduction for uh, each of our GYN oncologists that we're happy to have. We're a total of five now. Uh, Mike Fine and the Cancer Center Director uh, apologize for uh, not being able to be here today. Uh, had something come up with the family and needed to be home uh, this weekend, but he uh, sends his regards. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Nate Jones, originally from uh, Nashville, um, did his uh, medical school at East Tennessee, went to Asheville, North Carolina for uh, residency, and then up to uh, New York City, uh, New York Columbia, City. New York City, uh, for his fellowship. And um, we're happy to have him join us uh, last fall. Uh, he's an outstanding clinician, a great guy, uh, but we really hired him because we love his wife. Uh, she's the better part of the two. Uh, true, true story, true story. But uh, Nate's really uh, is, is developing and growing an expertise in genomic profiling for GYN cancers and how to apply that for clinical indications. Uh, and we're happy to have him. Uh, the debate is going to be to debulk or not debulk uh, for ovarian cancer. That is the question. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Scalisi, uh, who's associate professor uh, of GYN oncology and is the director of our basic and translational GYN lab. Uh, it's by no accident when she took over that role uh, with Luciana Barnes, who's our PhD in the lab, that it has really taken off. If you look at our grant funding uh, through that lab and our collaborations, uh, that she has taken a point of that. Uh, we've had over you know, 10 grants over the past few years. Our current funding total, uh, including one of our grants for DOD, which is looking at chemo prevention of ovarian cancer in a HEN model, uh, we have over $4 million of funding uh, uh, currently uh, due to her efforts. Uh, and so she is a, a rising star and so happy uh, to have her uh, and to keep her, hopefully. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Dr. Uh, Pierce, who joined us uh, last uh, October, November. I've known her for well over a decade. Uh, she's from um, South Carolina originally and went to uh, medical school at MUSC in Charleston. Uh, she then went up to the Brigham in Harvard for her uh, residency uh, and then did her fellowship at University of Virginia. Uh, she's uh, developed an expertise in national recognition for work in HPV-related illnesses uh, policy. Um, she's got her master's of public health at UVA as well. And she um, has been a leader both in South Carolina as well as now in Alabama with leading a statewide coalition for uh, health care and providing access uh, for patients, particularly in regards to HPV vaccination. So uh, all are great people. We're so happy to have them. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jones, who's going to moderate this uh, discussion, which hopefully will generate some laughs and discussion if I know these people well. So. <laughs> all right. Thank you for the uh, kind words and introduction. Um, so these uh, ladies do not need any more uh, presentation here. Uh, Dr. Pierce um, is going to be explaining uh, that for any surgeon worth their weight in um, <laughs> surgical grade stainless steel, the benefits of upfront up surgical debulking are clear and unarguable. Mm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Scalisi will then inform us that if we could possibly put aside our egocentric tendencies, uh, and use our pea-sized brains. Common sense will show us that the benefits of neoadjuvant chemotherapy are also clear Put and unarguable. Put down the knife. Uh, I urge you both to be respectful um, of one another, um, uh, be tasteful in your words and actions, and settle any disputes like civilized Southern women by talking trash behind each other's backs. <laughs> All right, without further ado, so debulking was the first treatment for ovarian cancer. It's been around since 1934. Um, at the time, it was described as tumors of the female pelvic organs because even then we knew that it had spread to multiple um, sites within the pelvis and was something that um, needed some sort of surgical removal. This is the average patient um, who comes in with a combination of large abdominal tumors and large volume of ascites. So this, this shouldn't scare us as do you want an oncologist. Now it'll scare a general surgeon, but that's okay. That's what we're here for, is to make sure they For Spencer. Okay. I know, he's not even here. Oh, Spencer. <laughs> so when you look inside, you can see these, um, these whiter areas uh, that, that show tumor both in, on the peritoneal surfaces as well as on the mental cake. This is transverse colon here. 
and um, we can see massive tumors that still, despite um, their very ugly appearance, are really relatively organ preserving. So they sit on the surfaces of the organs and are amenable to removal most of the time. So this is just the most common type of ovarian cancer, and forgive us, we use the term ovarian cancer to refer specifically to papillary serious adenocarcinoma of the ovary. That's 85% of ovarian cancers. When a woman comes to you and said, I'm one of the few, I, I was diagnosed in stage one and I survived ovarian cancer, there's a less than 1% chance that she actually had this disease. Um, there are <coughs> ovarian cancers that women survive that are more similar to testicular cancers, the germ cell tumors and stromal tumors. That's not really what we're talking about today. So when we talk about debulking and chemotherapy, we're talking about this papillary serous ovarian cancer. Um, because it is a majority, we simply say ovarian cancer. And it has these particular features, the capillary excrescences on the surface of the tumor. This may be a little bit hard to tell, but this is a uterus and two ovaries that have been removed. This, is, this little lump is her cervix. And so you can see this massive enlargement of the ovary on this side. This ovary most likely is also positive, and this is what it looks like microscopically. So um, some people would call this a diagnostic problem, that most of our patients are diagnosed at stage 3 or stage 4. I would submit to you that stage one and two high-grade serous carcinoma possibly don't even exist. So what we used to think of as spread throughout the abdomen might in fact be 100 stage one tumors, um, or is it possible that it's actually developing from the tube, the tip of the fallopian tube, and then the, tumor, the cells drip onto the ovary and thus cause what is already a metastatic tumor. And those same cells can then flow throughout the peritoneal cavity and at a relatively early time frame, meaning in the first six months, these patients have widespread metastatic disease. So I don't think this is a diagnostic problem. I think we've got a cure problem. Um, I sadly think much of the time that we have spent trying to find ovarian cancer sooner is a waste of money. So if a cancer develops in six months, there is no screening test for that cancer. It has to be something that takes years to develop for us to have a yearly screening test, or even, you know, these days we're spacing out mammograms and pap smears as well, something that actually could be done over the course of a lifetime to diagnose a cancer that's there in the earliest stages. If a cancer develops in six months, there is no screening test for that cancer. So the standard of care is surgery with maximum cytoreductive effort. And this is the big thing. You can look at a surgeon and ask, what is their rate of optimal debulking? And it may have to do with how good their nanny is, how late they are <laughs> willing to stay, whether or not they have a, um, a, something else to do that evening. There are, there is maximum effort and then there's maximum effort. So, you know, when you remove the uterus tubes and ovaries, that's one way to do maximum effort and that is standard of care, but do you take the extra time to shell off the peritoneum from the surfaces of the pelvis? Do you take the extra time to not only look for, but diagnose that nodule on the diaphragm to find that extra piece of momentum up by the spleen to do the splenectomy that would be required to take that out, to run the bowel and then take off every tiny piece that, of tumor that is on the small bowel. There are differences, unfortunately, in maximum cytoreductive effort. And it's impossible, it's impossible to randomize patients to that. It's impossible to hold surgeons to that standard unless you're in the operating room with them. But what we do know is there is a dose-dependent relationship between how much tumor you leave behind. So first, we know that you're supposed to look everywhere. And when we talk about GYN surgeons being unique from regular surgeons or regular OBGYNs, we're trained in all of these procedures. We are trained to not only do your hysterectomy and remove your ovaries, we remove your colon, your small bowel, your omentum, your spleen, part of your liver, part of your diaphragm, and there are some GYN oncologists who are doing debulking in the chest. So um, if it is ovarian cancer, it has our name on it, and we're happy to do whatever surgery you need. We uh, remove parts of stomach, parts of bladder, um, etc. in order to, um, to maximally involve the patient. 
And the goal is to do all of those things, to take out two more wherever it exists. Um, Lymph adenectomy is, is still, I think, a little bit controversial in the setting of the debulking of tumor. Once you have widespread disease, there's limited evidence that adding, that removing negative lymph nodes um, helps, but if the lymph nodes are bulky, it's an important part of surgery. So what is optimally debulked? Um, and that's a phrase that we use to set to divide patients into patients who are considered good candidates for other types of therapy and have the best prognosis. Um, traditionally, it's defined as leaving residual of less than one centimeter maximum diameter of any tumor nodule. So that means they can have 100 tumors left that are three millimeters in size each, or they can have one tumor left that's less than one centimeter in size. So obviously that is a spectrum and it is very much a moving target. But there is now good evidence that no residual disease, and that takes a lot of newness to write on your operative report that the patient had no residual disease. And frankly, if we CT scan all of them, if you believe the radiologist, then they would say that maybe we didn't get it all because there's usually still something there on the scan. Um, but the goal is to get out everything you can see to the naked eye. And that is a dose-dependent relationship. It, the thought is that there are pharmacologic sanctuaries, in particular the ovaries, but is it possible that ovarian cancer tumors themselves are sanctuaries away from chemotherapy, that the chemotherapy cannot penetrate those ovaries in the same way? Some of that is the, the general um, low oxygen tension of the peritoneal surfaces. So these tumors are not growing in the middle of the liver, where there's actually a really great capillary bed. These are tumors that are growing on the surface of organs. They have parasitic blood supply, and the, the chemotherapy is not actually getting to that tumor at its maximum concentration. Um, there is obviously an immunologic component that has allowed this to occur, that has allowed these tumors to exist. Um, alongside the immune system, and a decrease um, in chemo resistance. So you imagine if you have a thousand cancer cells left and I give you chemotherapy, then the likelihood is at least one of those is resistant. Now imagine you have a million cancer cells left and I give you chemotherapy, then there's a likelihood that there's a large volume that is still resistant to that chemotherapy that I have left in the body. So there's a theory that the less cancer cells you have, the time that the chemotherapy is introduced, the less likely you are to develop long-term chemo resistance and achieve a longer remission. And so this equates, all of this together equates to a more effective chemotherapy response. And we know that life and death occurs between when a patient is um, sensitive to our most common chemotherapy, carboplatin, versus resistant to carboplatin. And you can divide those into patients who are going to live five to 10 years versus patients who are going to live three to five. And once a patient becomes um, re chemo resistant, in their disease process, then that does significantly shorten their prognosis. Although it really increases their opportunity for clinical trials. <laughs> so, without spending a lot of time here, these are the number of trials that show a significant improvement in survival for patients who are optimally involved. And the median survival increases 20 months. Two years survival difference for patients who are optimally involved versus suboptimally involved. That is unarguable data. And so this is the thought that if we do primary site reduction at the time the patient is diagnosed, then they have their chemotherapy. Second look, laparotomy has ultimately been thrown out. Um, maintenance has never been decided on. And then there's the opportunity for surgery again at the time of recurrence with the thought that these patients um, can have a much longer remission than what Dr. Scalise will talk to you about is giving some chemotherapy first and then do a surgery in the middle. So this is just a survival curve that shows this dose-dependent relationship. So this is microscopic residual, less than one centimeter, less than two centimeters, greater than two centimeters. And you can see with that dose-dependent relationship, the more tumor you have left, the worse off you are. And this is a much smaller study, but again, confirms the same thing, that this tail of patients is way out here. This is seven years. And still, we have 30% of people still alive with ovarian cancer which when these trials were done was really unheard of. But as we move on, we're having longer and longer term survivors. So what about stage four disease and how aggressive should we be at the time of primary reduction? Generally, the thought is once you're in there, once you've made the decision to go to the operating room, that you do everything in your power to get it out. So that doesn't mean removing their entire liver. 
Obviously, that's not compatible with life. But if you can remove a wedge, you should. If you can remove a wedge of the diaphragm, you should. It should, in fact, be maximum cytologic effort. One of my professors said to me, it's really impossible to look inside with a camera and say whether or not you can. You really kind of have to get to work, get your hands dirty, and you often can do more than you could and kind of take what it gives you and keep moving along. And ultimately, in the surgery, you will get most of the tumor out. And it comes down to those last couple of places that, you know, if you've gotten everything else optimally devolved, now really is it worth doing two colon resections to get the chemo cancer out? And if everything else is gone, then yes, it is worth doing two colon resections to get the cancer out. You have to keep in mind 20 months improvement in survival. It's worth two extra hours of your time. So this, again, is a dose-dependent relationship. The higher the percentage of side reduction, the higher the survival. And it speaks to the fact that the uh, more expertise you have in a center that you're, the patient's being operated on by a gynecologic oncologist who does a lot of these surgeries, who has the surgical skills to do aggressive developing surgery along. Dr. Salisi, would you like to come Well, of course. I have a few things to say. So Dr. Pierce claims that that data is both clear and inarguable. Uh, I will agree with you that they are clear, but inarguable they are not. Uh, I'm gonna use actually two of her own arguments to start with. Medical oncologists in the room, what other cancer that presents, as she has proposed, at, at a metastatic phenotype do you send to a surgeon? Anyone? None? Is that right? So no other cancer that presents in a metastatic state is treated surgically. And we just argued that stage three and stage four ovarian cancer is actually all ovarian cancer that we're worried about. Right? Wait, wait. What other disease that is metastatic at diagnosis lives 10 years? 30% of people still live 10 years. You will have time for rebuttal later. <laughs> I'm gonna need you to sit tight. So number one, it presents, at, it presents metastatic at diagnosis. That is not a commonly surgical problem. Number two, what was the other thing you said? Hang on. <laughs> Um, volume tumor? No. Um, Hang on. Let's go back for just a second. I'll get back to that. So, so here's what I'm going to argue, right, is that chemotherapy is probably up front a smart idea. The other thing, if, if, in regards to the inarguable uh, argument for uh, debulking, how many of those trials were done before the advent of carboplatin? So when was carboplatin introduced? early 90s, right? Some of those trials were in the 80s. So yeah, if you don't have an effective chemotherapy to chase your surgery, then certainly surgery is all you've got, right? And so yes, you're gonna see a dose-dependent relationship on the amount of tumor cells that you remove because you don't have an effective chemotherapy to eradicate the rest of the tumor that, that is left behind. And I would argue that in the age of platinum and taxane and some of our targeted therapies, that that is not entirely true anymore. So we're gonna argue uh, that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is actually smart from a biological standpoint. We're gonna argue that it decreases morbidity. We're talking about taking out diaphragm, taking out liver, taking out colon. Those are morbid procedures. And these are women who are diagnosed at an average age of their 60s, right? And when you hit average age of 60 and you've got a belly like the one we just saw, you have other medical comorbidities that make that surgery difficult to recover from. And we just talked about the importance of chemotherapy, regardless of how much surgery you do. If you can't survive the surgery to get to your chemotherapy, then the surgery never mattered in the first place. So, new adjuvant chemotherapy plus interval surgical debulking, it is, is it feasible in ovarian cancer? Um, what I'll show you are some studies. Historically speaking, neoadjuvant chemotherapy has been reserved for women who could not tolerate surgery. So when you look at some of these studies, keep that in the back of your head. These are women who never made it to the OR. These are not randomized trials that said two equally matched people, one goes to the OR, one gets chemotherapy. No, no. These are women who never would have been a surgical candidate in the first place and only got chemotherapy. So a lot of these trials are going to look really bad, but you have to consider the selection bias. Um, not as effective as primary cytoreduction. reduction. What I'm arguing is it's based on the wrong type of trials. Uh, again, most primary studies with uh, primary surgery versus optimal debulking were not randomized, um, but we have a few that we'll talk about. 
So what's the goal? I will agree with Dr. Pierce. The ultimate goal, regardless of when you do your surgery, is optimal cytokine reduction. And that dose reduction or that dose uh, response curve is clear. But the way to get there might not be, it, it's arguable. Okay, so here's a couple of few of the neoadjuvant chemotherapy trials. This one in particular, were 63 consecutive stage three and stage four ovarian cancer patients, initially treated with uh, carboplatinum taxol therapy before surgery. Um, then they compared this to 109 women who uh, were, were uh, underwent primary debulking surgery. So these are the results. 95 women got optimal debulking surgery, or sorry, 95 women got ke uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, 71 primary debulking surgery, OR times were maybe a little bit different, although it's, it's not that different, I guess, when you're talking about two hours uh, adding on, taking off the uh, implants to the diaphragm. Uh, but look at the bud loss. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus primary surgery. These are morbid surgeries, and when you give chemo first and you reduce the tumor burden, there are less radical procedures that you have to do. Blood loss is less, hospital days are less, morbidities are less, and look at survivals. They're not significantly different. So this, this is the crown jewel, I would say, of neoadjuvant chemotherapy trials in ovarian cancer, and it was presented in 2009 um, by Dr. Vergote. Uh, this was a trial done in Europe, 1998 to 2006, so all within the platinum age. Do you want European healthcare? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will concede. I will concede it was done in Europe. All these people had to you will have your time. time. I'm reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. <laughs> all right, play nice, ladies. Okay. <laughs> so all within the platinum age, right? Everybody got uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. Primary debulking surgery over here versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy over here. Um, look at the optimal. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So 718 patients in 60 centers. There were 498 uh, events, meaning uh, survival changes and a median follow-up of 4.8 years. And here, is, here are the results. Upfront debulking surgery in red, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in blue, there is absolutely no difference in the survival whether you take somebody to surgery upfront versus uh, give them neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But they all lived less you will time have your time. You will States. have your time. I'm going to stop there actually and let you go because that's my rebuttal slide. Um, <laughs> but my, conclu my, my conclusions here are less morbid surgery. Is that what we were going to do? No, no, I think you have more slides. I thought that was our report. No, no, no. Okay. All right. So I'll go. I'll continue. <laughs> we kind of just put this together, yeah. as you can see. Um, so really quickly, nature versus nur nur uh, nurture. The elephant in the room, right? What is the biology of this disease? Is the biology of the disease allowing us to debulk to an optimal degree, requiring all this radical surgery? Or does the biology of the disease tell us that chemotherapy is the smart thing to do? And this was a trial that took uh, GOG-182. It was a giant phase three randomized trial looking at all types of chemotherapy combinations in ovarian cancer. Um, and these women all went, underwent primary debulking surgery. So they, they go back and they look at the chart, they do chart reviews of these ladies to try and decide what the tumor burden was at the beginning of, of their treatment at diagnosis, what their tumor burden was at the time after surgery, and how they did. Um, and this is what they found. So they established, let's see, disease complexity scores, and then they just established a surgery complexity score. These are the disease complexity scores. So yes, women that had more disease did worse. We know that. But when you look at surgery complexity, so this is adding all of those radical procedures that she said you spend hours trying to do where you incur your blood loss and your morbidity. If you look at the surgical com uh, complexity, there was actually no difference in survival no matter how hard you worked, no matter how sharp your knife is, no matter how long you stayed under the OR lights, it didn't matter. What mattered was how much disease there was in the first place. So yes, you want to get to optimal, uh, no residual disease. You want an optimal debulking. But the, the table has been set before you ever get to the operating room. And my argument is, if we're just adding morbidity, and we have a chemotherapy that works, starting with chemotherapy up front, minimizing the morbidity of surgery, and still achieving an R0 at the time of surgery is probably a smart way to move. I think that's all. Yes, so that's my conclusion. Cancer cannot be cured with just a knife alone. It doesn't matter how hard you work, you're not gonna get it all. 
and there we go. Lower morbidity equals survival. Uh, it will eventually become the standard of care. Uh, fellowship programs are going to be the last to evolve because fellows need to learn all of the radical procedures that we all learned. Um, and, and in some cases, I will argue that, that it is probably an appropriate thing to do. But I think um, we really need to think twice about the biology of the disease and what we're doing to patients uh, before we whisk them off to the OR. You want to yeah, rebuttal? I think so. All right, so now that you've heard this mumbo jumbo, <laughs> we'll, we'll finish up. There's another thing that Dr. Scalisi is not sharing with you. So since the advent of carboplaxol, we talked a little bit about the fact that the chemotherapy can't really get to these peritoneal tumors. There was an excellent study done, and it's been very controversial, mainly for doctors who don't understand statistics. But for doctors who do understand statistics, and for all of you, because I know you too can see the difference between 66 months survival and 50 months survival. That's the median overall survival for a patient who was treated with intraperitoneal chemotherapy after an optimal debulking surgery. So the patient had to have an optimally debulked surgery and then after that optimal surgery, they were given an option between chemotherapy directly into their abdomen versus chemotherapy IV. And those patients had little difference in progression-free survival from the curves up top, but a big difference in overall survival. And this still remains the primary trial that we think about when we talk about the benefits of IP chemotherapy with the patient. And the important thing is still there, that in order to benefit from this trial, they had to be optimally debulked first. So there are issues with the trial. The main one is the toxicity of the IP chemotherapy, which we've spent the last 10 years trying to work out the kinks of that and still get this maximum survival benefit. But even the patients, so the reason that I say people who don't understand statistics don't understand the trial, regardless of how many cycles of IP chemotherapy the patient received, they had a survival advantage. So they, um, I should say the group had a survival advantage because the trial was done in, with an intention to treat analysis. So regardless of how many cycles of IP chemotherapy you got before you decided that it was too toxic for you and you move over to that group, do you still, that entire group had a survival advantage. And so that says that actually the difference between these two groups was probably much larger for the folks who got all IP chemotherapy compared to a group that only got IV chemotherapy. So in fact, the survival advantage can be much larger. And I have seen patients, again, that seven, eight, nine, ten years before recurrence in patients who received IP chemotherapy. And there is some argument that it actually changes the biology of the tumor, that you, instead of now having a peritoneal spreading disease and dying early and quickly from a bowel obstruction, you now have a retroperitoneal disease, which is amenable to things like radiation, repeat surgical, ex, um, repeat surgical excision, and the opportunity to have more chemotherapy because you're still eating. And still able to Dr. Talk. Pierce, do you use that exact protocol when you administer IP chemotherapy? I don't, but you know no. what? I still see oh. less toxicity and improved survival in my patients. So, to conclude, there are some places for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Grandma, nobody wants to give an upfront surgery to a grandma over 80 years of age. Everybody knows that. Grandma does not get a debulking surgery. Lung meds and these are the people meds. they include in the studies that say neoadjuvant is worse, right? Because you never, you know, you're also never going to operate on it. They're included when they say surgery is worse. <laughs> but so, you just said no. Everybody knows lung you're not going to operate on it. We can't take out both of your lungs. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. And liver mets that are in multiple areas of the liver that you cannot remove multiple sections of the liver at a same time. But otherwise, w wouldn't we all want the <laughs> surgery? That, that Dr. Scalisi would want if she were to need a surgery, or that I would want if I had ovarian cancer. So let me ask we you. We want the same thing for our patients. Dr. Riccone, if you did, <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you did two bowel resections, a rectosigmoid resection, a transverse resection, and took off a wedge of liver, how excited are you to give IP chemotherapy? Not very. Right. 
And contrary to Dr. Pierce's, would you like a, your rebuttal? Real, yeah, it's, it's, it's over. It's over. Oh, I'm it's over it. No, and contrary to what Dr. Pierce has said, actually Deb Armstrong, who was the primary investigator for DOD 172, has moved back. So the toxicity was the issue. She's a medical oncologist. Yes, she's but like I want to make some more money. So why don't you come to see me? No, her? it's their data. It is and their that data. IP chemo no. is so so the issue with IP chemotherapy was that toxicity rate, and the the main issues with toxicity were the ports malfunctioned, and you've got a catheter sitting in a peritoneal cavity that you just operated on. Sometimes they eroded into bowel, sometimes there was infectious morbidity, and sometimes those patients didn't get IP because you had to take the port out. Not to mention the blown out diverticula that we had seen and the potential post-op complications that delayed the time to that anyway. So because of the toxicity issues, when that NCI bulletin came out in 2006 that said you all need to be doing IP chemotherapy, most people said I'll do it, but I can't give it like that. And furthermore, if you look at that study and the way it was designed, not only did they get IP therapy with cisplatin and Taxol, but they got an extra day eight dose of Taxol. So you're given a more chemotherapy, not just intraperitoneal, you're given a more chemotherapy in general. So the point is, so the point is we know that the doses of chemotherapy we're giving IV are MTD. MTD stands for maximum tolerated dose. That is the dose at which 30% of people will have a serious adverse event. That's how we design all of our chemotherapy clinical trials. So the dose that we're giving IV, unfortunately we can't give any more. The point is we found a way to give more. Sure, it's more chemotherapy. It cannot be replicated IV. That's the whole point. But what I'm saying is <laughs> you're giving more IV chemotherapy and you directly compare that to somebody who is only getting IV chemotherapy. Both they were not <clears throat> a maximum tolerated dose. They got an extra day eight. That was the study. This the, yeah, there is yeah. they got more. <laughs> they I got totally more. Agree. Come on, come on. <laughs> they got extra chemo. The point is the point is it was not as randomized and, and clear per group as it sounds. Furthermore, Deb Armstrong's group has gone back to using the GOG 172 protocol because the modifications that we've made to make it more tolerable were not as effective. So just, just, I just charge you not to abandon the principles of biology, right? The, the idea that this is a biological disease that we need to treat just because you got a knife. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So there. <laughs>